So welcome to this breakout session. So the intention, who, n nobody, was anyone here at the 2020 Community Day? Has anyone done like an unconference before or a DevOps days? Okay. And you all, you know, open spaces in a DevOps days. So that's the intention here, right? Like, this is not me standing up here and talking to you. This is everyone kind of chatting amongst themselves and using, you know, our lovely flipboards to kind of note things and, and come to realizations and discuss what's important. Now, this is also being recorded for posterity. Um, so with that in mind, I have no clue how we're going to do this, but we have microphones that people can use. So if someone wants to, you know, like I'm, I'm just going to Johnny Appleseed these around, I guess, and people can maybe just put that like there-ish. And someone want to be the mic minder for this side, and then someone over here want to be like, the, yeah, that that looked like volunteering to me. <laughs> so. Does someone want to volunteer to kind of take notes and help facilitate? Cool. Come on up. You've been appointed, self-appointed. Yeah, come on. Give it, give it up for uh, <laughs> Libby. Thank you, Libby. So, um, what I think a good way to start something like this is. You know, this is kind of two things, right? This is eBPF, this is auto-instrumentation. So maybe just help um, take some notes from people. Let's go around and kind of say, like, you know, what... Let's basically figure out some brainstorm some topics, right? And then just kind of jot the topics down, and then people can kind of, like, rank those a little bit, and people can sort of discuss those. And again, it's like a DevOps Days open space if you've been to that, right? Yeah. So, do our mic, our mic handlers want to make sure they're on and then people start kind of talking to the mic? Test. Yeah, okay. I'm going to check in the other room. So, you all start to discuss among yourself. <laughs> so, I'm interested in knowing uh, w uh, w when and what are the circumstances in which we could use eBPF uh, instrumentation to replace any language specific implementations, I guess. And you know, that might reveal that I don't know a damn thing about EVPF. How about that? I was just going to say, I'm behind when it comes to figuring out uh, how EVPF works into my work. Uh, so I've read the basic directions, but I haven't had hands on. So it'd be kind of cool for somebody who's had hands on who knows how to TLDR, too long, didn't read, what eBPF is for anybody who doesn't. Does anybody, is anybody brave enough to say, I don't know, I could use a quick refresher on eBPF? Okay, enough people here, and then you've written it down. Is there anybody, well, before we keep going, is there anybody who can, maybe two minutes on eBPF, sum it up for people? Henrik and somebody else, okay. Uh, uh, but we can move. We could spend some time like that, but maybe not now. Like, let's get to the topics. Um, so the TLDR of eBPF is historically it comes like this is literally two decades old. It comes initially from uh, automating extraction of of um, network data and analysis of of network data. If you heard of the Bro project or such from two decades ago, that's that's where the root of all of this is coming from. These days, the extended uh, Berkeley packet filter, and it's still a packet filter, but it is now, now more generic, gives you hook in the Linux kernel where you can um, insert, and you basically have a little bit like callback points where you can put more or less arbitrary code, which is executed when something happens. The thing which allows you, or the thing which is enabled by this, is you can have a fleet-wide aggregation of, hey, how is my thing actually looking and the thing does not need to be specified. So the good thing is you can, across your whole fleet, extract data from whatever you're running and it is not specific to your workload. That's also a downside. 
Of course, if you instrument your code by hand, you're really near to what you're actually doing and you have all this context and you have it in code. So it's really easy to attach proper metadata to your whatever you're emitting because you know what you're doing and where you're doing it and why you're doing it. Whereas eBPF inherently is looking at things more from the outside. Personally, I, I do expect that eBPF will be more of use when you have large fleets, in particular hyperscalers and such. Um, of course, they, they gain a lot of knowledge just from looking at things from this high level, whereas if you have smaller workloads, arguably directly instrumenting is more valuable. Also, and then I'm going to stop, um, you're having a little bit of a problem similar to, to profiling there, unless you have your signals and uh, your, your symbols and everything in a format which allows you to, to walk back on how that actually code looks, eBPF doesn't know what's happening. And also you can't trace a specific request. That's, that's I mean, it's possible, but it's super hard and super wasteful to do with eBPF. It, it it can, but it, uh, on a different level, of course, it's just on kernel level. The kernel knows what is being executed, what is being done, but it doesn't know where this path is being taken. The idea is that you're going to define the event where you're going to run some code, and the kernel will basically trigger your code, so your code should be very lightweight. And then you can do whatever you want. You can count the number of times there is a socket that has been opened, for example. But then you keep in mind that you want to exchange that information to your user space because yeah. you are at the kernel level. You cannot do much. That's why there is a BB eBPF maps where you're going to take the data that you have constructed, store it into a BBF map, and that eBPF map could be consulted through uh, your observability solution that could store that information. So it's very, uh, the, the way you build eBPF programs should be very lightweight in C program. And you know ex need exactly to know which event going to trigger, what you're going to measure. Uh, you can do tons of things with, with programming language as well. But again, it's very difficult. You don't manipulate the context. You just been, you trigger a code when an event happens. So you cannot add any annotations, any context uh, to that data that you just uh, been observing. Dumb question. What does eBPF stand for? Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. Anybody, or enhanced. Anybody else have any other definitional additions to that? Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. So this is uh, this is Linux kernel specific, right? This is Linux kernel specific. This is not. Uh, there are there any ports to any other operating systems? Yeah. Uh, my no. Windows does support EBPF. Excellent. Oh. Yeah. Fully. So just for for the recording, uh, it was just stated that um, Windows also supports eBPF. Yeah. No, the, just uh, for the recording, of course, people, yeah, the, unless uh, we use the Microsoft has uh, published uh, about Windows support. Do you, they do it with the W7 Linux version? Not, not at least, uh, it is in the Windows operating system. Windows I'm curious if anybody has practical experience where they've used it in production, gotten benefits from it, if they could describe it. Yeah. Pixie, Parca? Yeah. Pixie uh, Labs is relying on eBPF. Parca? Parca is also relying on eBPF. So uh, uh, we have no information about how it scales, <laughs> but they are running in production for sure. Okay. Pixie is the control plane. Um, that basically controls. Oh, we, we're currently experimenting at AWS. Uh, I mean, my, I am, and then some of my friends not AWS all. So, um, so uh, we are able to collect um, uh, profile data and then send that to um, CloudWatch and 
uh, other services through uh, through open telemetry collector yeah so we're currently experimenting that no no no, no. Big, yeah the uh, ebpf has been naturally been designed for network uh, initially for the the original origin of the name uh, no Bro. And uh, the, that's why Cilium, I don't know if you heard about Cilium. Cilium is doing a great job for security or uh, for uh, any uh, networking rules because it's designed for that. So I think, it's, I think the eBPF could provide a lot of value for the future of service mesh where you will have more lightweight without any uh, proxy sitting in between your, your containers, your, your pods. So I think that's, but for, for profiling also could be interesting, but again, it's very difficult to say so, so far. Uh, oh. In, in service mesh, you in most of the service mesh, they inject a container in your pods that will do the proxy job. And in the case of EPF, you don't need that anymore. So you remove one workload uh, in your cluster. So one thing that I think is like a open question, and maybe for the people that have been using Pixie or EVPF in prod, how are we expected to share context between OTEL context and a, like an EVPF context, right? Because these are working at different layers of the stack. And open telemetry itself kind of requires that context layer to be propagated and everything else. Is there a fundamental mismatch here that we need to figure out some way to like push things down or pull things, you know, at the at lower labels be able to kind of like pull that context out? Is there a context that needs to be propagated at the kernel level or the networking stack level that Pixie can, that something above it can then read and associate these telemetry types together? Because it seems to me like the full OTEL context implementation would be pretty heavyweight to run at, you know, on the kernel. Yeah, it's actually not clear to me how you can, you know, propagate context in the kernel because context is fundamentally a, like application concept, right? So the kernel wouldn't know like which span is the child of, you know, a different span. The kernel, the Pixie does uh, say, say it does read the, you know, the uh, HTTP headers and kind of figure out, you know, it can, it's just it's like, you know, in, in Istio, the, the Istio sidecar, you know, it, it can generate the spans. But in this case, uh, you know, eBPF hooks can generate the spans. But still, the application, you know, needs to handle the context. Uh, do we want to drill in more on any one of these? Yeah, so following on to that. Um, so you're in the context of code. You, you are the program you're executing. You're thinking about the moment of execution. That's usually why we have to layer in stuff into our code, right, to pr propagate the context. For EPPF, is it just, it's just about network, right? Uh, and and no, 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 it's no, no, kernel no. as well, right? No. It's hooks in the kernel. Yes, but it's not just about the network anymore. Okay, Initially, good. it's coming from the networking space. Yep. Um, of course, at what was horrendous speeds of one gigabit back then, right. uh, you couldn't do deeper analysis without a combination of having a hardware network cards, which did on-card ASIC analysis, and also hooks in the kernel. And several iterations la uh, later, uh, it's extended to basically pretty much everything in the kernel. Yeah. And I think one of the hard humps to get over, is if, if we are going, we were talking about uh, replacing language with specific implementations with eBPF. That's the hardest thing to get over is to deal with the fact that there's a million ways to write threads, subthreads, you know what I mean, process, you, you, you would have to be very specific in, in that model, in the process and threading model to be able to propagate any kind of context. And I'm sure we could, I'm sure you can, you can extract from layer seven the context that's coming in and follow it to a certain degree, but that it gets really tricky 
inside, you know, there's a, there's a million ways I could write how to, how to get a program to write and how would you, how would you duplicate, would you duplicate it, would you fork it, uh, the context across those processes and threads just to get like what is actually, so I think the, the easy sledgehammer right now is to expect people to write this stuff in their code, right, to, to propagate their own context, but is it impossible? I think we just need to work on it. I, I, the only way I, uh, I, the only way I was thinking, I mean, maybe I'm completely wrong, is you have to put a small agent close to your app. It will get the events, uh, share it, create the right stuff, because the agent knows the context. He knows which program is running. He doesn't know which function is necessary, but you have to go through uh, the profiling level. But that's the only way to get the context, because you're getting the event from there, and the agent sits somewhere, so he knows pretty much what it's supposed to do. But that's, that's what I thought in, initially, but I, maybe I'm wrong. So you, you need to have an agent, from my perspective, close to your app. That will help you to get the, this context. And so I, so I had a conversation with a guy named Ryan Perry over at Pyroscope, uh, which is a cool little open source thing that does profiling and continuous profiling. Um, and we were talking about the overhead, right? When you're actually tracing calls, not only do you need the symbols, as mentioned, right? But you, you also incur a certain amount of overhead just to sample that stuff. I don't think that's an intractable problem because you can decide what to sample. You don't have to sample everything. Sampling every, every uh, call under the call, call stack, everything in the call stack for everything is, is impossible. But I think that's the only way that we get with an agent, to your point, um, the, the profile of what's being executed has to have that context. And once you have that context up somewhere, as like a, a smaller segment or sub subset of the total data, then you can correlate it with, you know, the layer seven stuff, I think. Does that make sense to anybody else? So I have a question about the experiment. So, so I haven't looked at this myself, but there was a, an experiment posted here. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to look at this, but that uses eBPF to instrument the Go binaries at runtime. Has anyone had a chance to look at that? I don't know if they have any feedback on it, because I haven't been following it, but I was, it just bit me in the ear, just no. I think there's a project called Keyvel or something, which is trying to do this Golang uh, auto in instrumentation uh, on, on eBPF level, which is similar to uh, what, what uh, the Prometheus uh, uh, Java libraries allow you to do where in the JVM you auto instrument the code because you have a place where you can do this and that's basically applied to the same uh, the same mechanism and I think this is super interesting because at the end most developers or at least their managers won't care too deeply about this being instrumented they want the, the benefits not the actual work being put in so having having a baseline of auto instrumentation would be would be super interesting. I I don't know how this could be done specifically. Like I can imagine that if, for example, you have uh, certain wrapper functions, you can actually, from kernel level, determine what is being called in user space, and then again you have a symbols file which tells you which is which, and so you can trace back what is happening. And in particular, at larger scales, this is super interesting. Of course, you you don't have to extract all the data from all the programs. You do it way more efficiently in the in the uh, orchestrator in this current uh, um, the kernel. I think that auto instrumentation is going to be one of those super important things in the medium term. Of course, it it allows you to not spend time on instrumentation. You only spend the time where it really benefits you, and the rest you get more or less for free. It might not be perfect. Um, but you get this baseline. Uh, I actually wanted to kind of not challenge that point, but I want to flip it on its head. Just speaking from experience, right, you know, Fender, but most of our very successful users of Lightstep tend to be people that are in Go. And the reason they're successful is because the lack of auto instrumentation in Go means that you actually have to sit down and you have to think, okay, I'm going to model my system with these traces and I have to actually go and I have to write that instrumentation. The current sort of thinking about observability in the industry is 
this is something that helps you create data to model that, you know, to let you say, hey, here's code that describes what I think my system should be doing and how it should look and act and function. Auto instrumentation doesn't necessarily like go towards that goal because all it's doing is showing you the shape of what actually is. And it's usually giving you a lot of stuff that you probably don't need at the end of the day, right? Is there sort of a, from an observability perspective, sort of a secondary or tertiary way of thinking about this where we use auto instrumentation to like very rapidly get us set up to the point like to do all the initialization, to do the bootstrapping, to give us kind of that basic level of context prop at the application level. And then we have stuff like eBPF on demand for security, for profiling use cases, stuff like that, right? You know, I think when we talk about this, especially outside of people that are nerding out about telemetry, um, it doesn't necessarily always translate to you know, the person at the other end of the table where they're thinking like, oh, you just mean I need to run Pixie and I don't have to do any of this other investment in telemetry or, you know, creating spans or da 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 da, da right? So some of this, we need to be better and more specific about like the exact role of continuous profiling in our systems, you know, have people had conversations about this with customers or, you know, coworkers or, you know, I was gonna, I'm, I'm I, throwing I mean, it to you Anecdotally, I would say that, I, I, you know, my end users are, all they do is complain that they don't have continuous profiling and they like tracing but don't love it and they want me to do everything for them and they don't want to write any code at all and they're like, how come I don't see this stuff automatically up here downstream? Um, so I have the opposite experience, I think, where it's like people want more things freely available to them, like free as in they didn't have to write anything extra. Um, so I, and in particular, Golang programmers are very finicky with me about be telling them, <laughs> yes, go ahead and use these key value pairs and the attributes because they like it. They really don't enjoy the ergonomics of the interface of using attributes. So it, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm constantly arm wrestling people, I guess, Yeah, me personally. I, I think both of you are right, but you're talking about different things. So yes, I absolutely agree, and as much as my experience that our most effective and efficient users and, and customers are the ones who actually think about what they're doing. Um, but this is not the majority, and also here in this room, we have a highly self-selected group of people who actually care about this stuff. Whereas the normal person is more on this side or on, on his customer's or user's side, um, they don't care, they just want to have the benefits. And yes, they won't be as good, by most certainly not, but they have something. Um, so I think you're just talking about different uh, user groups, but the thing is his intended audience is like 10x or 100x larger than the people who actually care about this stuff. So on the open telemetry level, it makes sense to care about this larger group of people. Yeah. I just wanted to add with everything that's been discussed about the difficulty for new users using open telemetry, this would add another barrier if it wasn't implemented in a way where they didn't need to know all of these things off the bat, right? And also continuous profiling. Um, continuous profiling, I don't know how relevant that is with eBPF because with continuous profiling, you're like, you want to see even the private functions that you're calling within your application. You want to see how long a particular piece of code is taking, are there any exceptions if that's using more memory and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm just not clear on that. Because with eBPF, you're basically only capturing all, all those things that you, you are intercepting with a piece of line of, uh, I mean, some lines of code when a kernel, um, uh, the kernel is basically invoking your code. And that is basically when maybe let's, you're, let's say you're making HTTP call or maybe making some gRPC calls, then you want to log that. But with continuous profiling, you're like every single line of code the application executing is being kind of monitored. That's when your developers are interested because they want to know, tell me which part of my application is causing problems so I can go fix it, which they don't get, right? So. Netflix did that many years ago with flame graphs. So they were, uh, with their system using eBPF, they're able to get uh, all the stack going through the kernel and they're building those yeah. flame graphs showing you 
the flames is the top of your user functions and then go down to the kernel on the bottom and they can good track and everything. And then they store every single small profiling from one single timestamp in huge database. And then you can click on one single pixel, which is a timeline of your production, and you can see the flame graph of that actual pixel, which is impressive. But, uh, but they did it ten, eight years or 10 years ago. So for continuous profiling, I, with my tech observability head on, I strongly believe that this is the fourth signal which, which is emerging. And do you see this again and again and again after metrics logs traces? Depending, like, specific order dep depends on who is the user, but the next logical step after traces is usually uh, continuous profiling. As to eBPF specifically, I think for open telemetry, there is a difference in, in how pressing the need is. If you have a Go application, you don't really need to have this in, uh, in eBPF because you have something nice in Go already. If you have a Python uh, application, um, it's a lot more pressing to have something outside of this because you don't have any, any other place to do this or nothing built in. Java sits in the middle because you have a different place. You can use JVM for all of those things. but. In the generic case, I think, yes, absolutely, that, that continuous profiling is one of the next things for, for open telemetry. Is that synonymous? Um, there were two mentions of profile, one in, I think, Elolita's uh, talk, towards the end of the talk. Is profile synonymous with the continuous profiling topic that we're yes. talking about? Okay, so these are the same things. Good. Words matter. Okay. Yes. And also, like, with both Elolita's and my tech, uh, chair hats on, sorry, I'm still half asleep, jet lagged. Um, again, this is something which we see as one of the next things which which we as the observability community need to engage with and actually solve okay. in a more generic case and establish standards, open formats, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine we're going to get into a lot of language specific, runtime specific uh, mm -hmm. translation of the every every language has their own different symbols and it's going to essentially be the same kind of situation as open telemetry with different language bindings and stuff for profiling that, that's part of the promise of ebpf of course you don't have this you you get reduced feature set and such you get re, you reduce your visibility at least depending on how it's specifically implemented but you get this for free across everything which you're running doesn't matter what language Run it in a Fortran, doesn't matter. eBPF will still be able to extract meaningful data from it. See, now I really have to go home and play. <laughs> I, I also want to point out, like, there's a really great, um, this hasn't been realized yet, but there's a huge opportunity for sort of brownfield monitoring scenarios and eBPF where, like you said, Fortran, right? Like, there's immense immense program observability programs at very very large companies that have significant you know kind of legacy technology stacks that they want to integrate you know if, if you're a bank if you're you know a big bank then yeah you've got 20 billion mainframes still running every single request that goes through your system at some level so you need a way to kind of connect and view both the new stuff and the old stuff or there's a desire for it, at least, if maybe not a need. For mainframes, you don't have eBPF. But um, you've got it at the part that's actually connecting. Yes. So the, the thing about Brownfield is correct, and also um, it's about closed source. That's one of the things with, with my Grafana head, on which I see a lot. People who want to use eBPF um, have massive installations <coughs> on things they do not have the source code for. And even if yeah. they have it, they have a binary which has been certi by, certified by a state agency, right. so they can't just recompile it or anything. Right. Yeah. They have to work with, with what they have. They cannot re-instrument this. Yeah. So to that uh, point, I and mean, this isn't really an auto-instrumentation question, but maybe it is. You know. We spend a lot of time right now, I mean, in my presentation earlier, right, the most popular library, or the most popular repos in terms of activity is like Java Contrib and Collector Contrib. So there's obviously quite a bit of energy going towards zero change, you know, zero code change instrumentation. Um, 
do we think that there's a real opportunity? I mean, I already, I'm gonna answer my own question. Like, it's never going to be anything other than that because like you said, there's a lot of people that have binaries, that have programs that they can't make source changes to, or they're on old versions of things that they're never gonna update. Like, even if you got to the point where you said, okay, every single framework has open telemetry built in, then that doesn't matter because people are gonna be running five or 10 year old versions of Spring Framework and they're gonna need that auto instrumentation plugin to work. So what can we do to sort of make it easier for those auto instrumentation libraries to get created and maintained? Like I think there's a problem right now with sort of the, the breadth of it, right? Is there something that we can be doing as maintainers or as people that are involved to sort of ease the maintenance burden of auto instrumentation? Discuss amongst ourselves. Well, I have a mic, so and I just before we move on to the 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 maintenance problem, the Henrik and I probably know from the performance and reliability space, and then moving on to SLO space, that there's always going to be people who are like, just do it for me, right? Just make it easy, like magic box this for me. And I don't want to know. The tension is not what you need to know in order to make that happen. That's what we need to solve for. How little you need to know about the thing, but, the, but also we have to require people to provide the context from their human brain into that, right? And so, the, the next layer on that, what I found works really well from people who are like, I just want you to tell me what my performance should be. I just want you to tell me what my SLO value should be. Is like, okay, give you a little bit, like you're saying. Fine, auto instrumentation, just to get them to the point where then they have to ask, the, they, they see the values, they see a little bit of value out of it, but then they're like, I wish it could do this. And then you can say, what did I freaking tell you? You have to provide some context into that to get that information out, right? You have to wet their whistle. You almost have to like stage the question in their mind is, why is this not good enough? And then, and then it becomes, they start to own that problem a little bit more. And that's the idealistic way of saying it. Not every, it's, it's hard to get that going. But I think not trying to solve the 100% for them is actually the way forward, right? It is, is solve it just enough where they start going I need more. Good. You need more. You need to do this thing, you know? So anyway, so then going back to what Austin, uh, what Austin was saying. But just one thing related to the, the example of the Fortran code, the Legacy code, code. EVPF requires a certain version of the kernel. So even if you have auto instrumentation on EVPF, Maybe even this company using legacy code won't be able to use it because it doesn't even run on the right kernel version. Yeah, I mean, there's usually some sort of like connector though, right? It's something a little more modern that's actually managing the RPC, you know, that's proxying your RPCs from whatever your fancy new stuff is into your, you know, less fancy old stuff. So it's, it's not obviously a flawless thing. And like putting taking off my whatever hat and putting on my like Austin's personal opinion hat, I think a lot of the driver of this is really almost sales driven in a way from like the vendor side where we're really just trying to find something, find something that is reducing time to value, right? And eBPF seems like the ultimate like, oh, you don't have to do anything to your code, you just run this and boom, you get all this data. You know, maybe that's cynical of me to suggest. Like, I do think there's actually really good applications of it, but it's hard to uh, not view it somewhat cynically. But that's a side. Yeah, you know, that's just an aside. I absolutely agree that there is a huge hype around eBPF, uh, and not all the promises will be realized, as is usual with with any hype. Um, I mean, we are sitting in a room uh, talking about how to use eBPF with open telemetry, and um, the majority didn't have a firm understanding of what eBPF is, which is not like meant negatively in any way, but as a statement of fact, um, the hype was was what has driven people into this room largely, not 
that they already have it in use and they already derive value. And not all of this hype will be realized, but um, I, I do think that when we when we have at least this auto instrumentation thing for all your old stuff, and yes, giving incentives, but it's not about telling people, it's about showing actual value and then they want it. Just telling them is usually not a good way. <laughs> Um, I think that's the, that's the main promise of all of this. I'm just saying, if you, I'm just saying the, the, the point there is there's only so much that you can build for people, yes. but your real goal is to compel them to change, to act differently, right? Yes. And but so it's, it's like Eric Prigler says, right? If you ship a report to somebody and they don't do anything, anything different, you have failed. So it's kind of like if, if we provide the, the very best, it's got to be just enough where they're now able and in a mental place where they're asking the right question, you know? Not all of them. I, I fully agree uh, that the majority doesn't care about all of this. Um, at, from, from their angle, this is just something which is service or infrastructure. Water comes out the wall, you don't care about how. Electricity comes out the wall, you don't care about how. And I, I think there's a good argument to be made for observability to, to also come out of the wall to at least some extent as a baseline. Part of the problem is uh, with all the cloud native and horizontal scalability, blah, 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 blah. The fundamental workloads are, the ba are basically the same. They're the same for the last 50 or 100 years the service delineations and which part of containment we put what type of service and what scope of service into, how to do the orchestration, who does the actual orchestration, what is the scheduler, all of those things have been broken up and rearranged and rejiggled. So a lot of the things which we used to have with classic boxes and, and classic servers have gone away. And a lot of this, it's just there and it works and it just does the right thing for you as a decent baseline needs to be rebuilt. And that's where I see much of the value. So uh, one thing I want to clarify is uh, as far as like the experience I was describing, it's more about the work required to collect the information. And I, I think analyzing that information, analyzing the data, the traces, the metrics, um, that's on the um, you know partially on the vendors uh, who implement solutions that help you generate insights out of it and part of that is a change in attitude right building an SRE mindset because I'm not going to be the one that can describe what your burn rate should be and what your SLO targets are that's up to you and your product manager but I think I want to go back to kind of like where I, the, the big burning question for me is how can we leverage eBPF in auto instrumentation and what are the constraints that prevent us from doing that? Um, and what problems will we run into if we, like for me, right, we, we um, in the Ruby sig, we are rewriting code and constantly dealing with changes in uh, libraries that are getting pulled in. And we don't have that many maintainers to try to deal with that. Um, and the, the, you know, from my perspective, the virtual machine isn't very uh, amenable to you going in there and making changes to it so that you could add instrumentation at the virtual machine level. And then we have different targets, right? We have JRuby and uh, CRuby and who else knows what other Ruby is going to come out in the future. So those are all maintenance problems for our team, which is very small. And I'm trying to figure out a way to provide value or to make data collection easier, instrumentation data collection easier, uh, and minimize the, the code that we have to maintain. And so um, part of this is my ignorance again about the promises of EBVF and what we can do and what we can't. Um, and the other part of it is kind of like, uh, is again, just like me trying to take workload off myself, personally speaking, and my teammates. So I don't know, like for, for anyone who's, I, I ask again, like has anybody had a, an experiment with this, trying to use EBVF for auto instrumentation of a language? Does this make no sense at all to do? Should we not even try? I don't know. Um. One thing that we are currently exploring on the community demo is popping Pixie in there um, since they started OTLP export and trying to figure out like, well, what does it look like to have 
you know, like, is there a way that sort of, given what we have now, we can actually make correlatable data between like OTEL at the app layer and then eBPF at the networking layer, right? And if that, you know, that's gonna be something we figure out through experimentation, like you can go find Carter and ask him what he thinks about it. Um, but I think I'm the only one that's actually open an issue about this so far. Um, but yeah, the goal honestly is, I, I think the only way people are gonna understand it is if they have something that like looks and feels like a cloud native app that they can kind of like put their hands on and say, oh, this is what eBPF looks like in production, in production, right? So here's like a sample app that you can kind of compare and contrast. Like, here's what I get out of Otel with traces and metrics and logs, and then here's what I'm getting out of EPF, and it, it's coming out as a trace, yes, but these are tracing fundamentally different things at different layers of the stack. Um, is that data useful from an analysis perspective? Huh? Like, that's for our, our friends at New Relic and Lightstep and Grafana and everyone else to figure out. Like, Anyway, that said, um, it is half past, so if people want to switch sessions or if you want to stay here and keep talking about this, you know, cool. Um, but I want to give people the opportunity to rotate between the breakouts if you like. Great discussion, by the way. So if you want to stay and continue Pro adding to the board. It probably makes sense to reiterate what the other sessions are. Yeah, the other session is uh, intermediate open tracing and context prop. Is that it? Paul? Signal correlation, yes. I believe you were the one who suggested it, so. Okay, good. Yeah. Signal correlation, though, that's the way that we're, we're talking about a lot of different stuff. Yeah, yeah.